The family of a missing Bayswater man is fearing the worst after a month-long police search failed to find any trace of him. It's been two weeks since the disappearance. Today on Facebook, her family have made a plea to the general public. In 2012, the Wall Street Journal reported that it's estimated that around 8 million children go missing around the world every year. The UK has a population of almost 67 million people and it has been found that someone is reported as missing every 90 seconds, sometimes in even less time than that. There are between 180,000 and 340,000 missing person incidents every year in the UK. All of the disappearances you will learn about throughout this video have either never been solved or contain some very strange elements, or both. I am currently in the process of researching and documenting many of these missing person cases throughout the UK and will be working on a book. I am also going to be personally visiting some of these locations where a person has gone missing to gain a better understanding of the surroundings. I will begin making a documentary about some of the disappearances after May, so you can expect that later during the year. Anyway, you can find all of the sources in the description below, and with that being said, here's the first case. William Jones, a miner from Meredy, located at the head of the Rondafac Valley in Wales, had planned a trip to take his five-year-old son, Tommy Jones, to see his grandparents who lived on a farm near the town known as Brecon. On the 4th of August, 1900, which was a Saturday before a bank holiday, Tommy and his father set off. They travelled by train and arrived at the town at 6pm that evening. From there, they had to walk roughly 4 miles to reach the farmhouse, which was located deep in the valley and north of the Beacon Mountains. After walking for 2 hours and at 8pm that night, they reached the Login, which is now in ruins. This is a place where soldiers were encamped for training at the rifle range further up the valley. The exact temperature that day is unclear, but it was reported as being very warm, and as a result of this, despite only having a quarter of a mile left to travel, William stopped for refreshments and bought Tommy some biscuits at the canteen. By chance, Tommy's grandfather and cousin, Willie John, 13 at the time, also arrived at the canteen. Willie was asked to go back to the farm and tell his grandmother to expect Tommy and William. Willie did so and began to run back towards the farmhouse. Tommy wanted to go too, and ran off with him up the valley. It was beginning to get dark at this point, and the boys had to cross two rough plank bridges. One of them was without a handrail. It was thought that at this point, with the light fading away, that Tommy got frightened. The boys were halfway to the farmhouse, and because of his fright, Tommy began to cry, and decided to head back to his father at the login. Willie, on the other hand, made it to the farmhouse and then returned to the login within a quarter of an hour only to find that Tommy wasn't there. Willie, the grandfather, and William immediately began searching the area for him. Around 20 minutes after the initial search, they were joined by the soldiers from the camp. Midnight came around and the search was halted, presumably to ensure that no one else got hurt or lost. At 3am, the search started again, only this time the searchers' numbers soared as the police and the general public got involved. Despite having many people out looking for Tommy, he wasn't found that day and there was no sign of him at all. The search continued for weeks afterwards, with many people searching tirelessly for the boy. Every single day, the search parties were formed of police, soldiers, farmers and other civilians who combed the entire area systematically, but still could not locate a single trace of Tommy. Authorities began to suspect that Tommy must have fallen off one of the footbridges and into the stream below, or alternatively had wandered straight on down the valley instead of making the correct turn and going across the second bridge. Taking this into consideration, the search concentrated in the wooded country around the Login and down the valley as far away as Brecon Waterworks, but despite this, they could still find no trace of Tommy. At this point, the police began to suspect that Tommy might have been kidnapped, which was also thought was the last hope that Tommy might still be found alive. Many gypsies had settled in campsites around the Breckenshire area, along with neighbouring counties, and the police had ransacked many of them, but this was unsuccessful. News of this incident spread like wildfire, the press picked it up, and was soon being reported across the country. The Daily Mail took an interest in the matter and offered a £20 reward, which is the purchasing power of £2,336 in 2019, to anyone who could solve this case. 
The Daily Mail sent a special commissioner to Brecon, whose influence made the gypsy kidnapping theory lose ground and instead thought it more likely that Tommy had been abducted by a childless woman or a couple, or alternatively had been murdered, though also said that he did not believe that this was the case. After several weeks of searching, William's family pleaded with him to return home to Murdy, and he did so, but soon came back as he was unable to cope with the fact that his boy might still be out there in the wilderness. After William's return, he was one of several people who climbed to the top of the beacons in their desperate search. At this point, Breckensbeacons.org reported, a Mrs. Hamer, a gardener's wife at Castle Maddock, some miles north of Brecon, having read accounts of the search, is said to have dreamed of the very spot where Tommy was to be found. She spent a couple of restless days before finally persuading her husband to borrow a pony and trap on Sunday the 2nd of September, to take her and some relatives to the beacons which they had never climbed before. Mrs. Hamer's husband was not convinced that they would find anything and went through with it to put her mind at peace. However, later that day, they reached the top of a ridge and made their way towards the peaks across some open ground where the husband, who was first in line, found the body of Tommy Jones. The death was reported to be as a result of exposure and exhaustion. However, one problem remained. No one could explain how this small, five-year-old boy, tired and hungry, managed to reach the location his body was found. According to BreckenBeacons.org, the location was 686 meters above sea level, a climb of 400 meters from the login, at least two miles over difficult ground and probably in the dark. During the search, it had not been considered worthwhile to make a thorough search of high ground as authorities thought that it was an impossibility that a five-year-old boy could have made it up a mountain, not only that, but children who go missing typically walk downhill. Interestingly, it was also mentioned that when Tommy's father William climbed up the mountain himself, he must have been within a dozen yards of the body, but didn't see it. Does this indicate that the body was not there when the father searched? The question must also be asked, how in the world did Tommy manage to get up there? Does this indicate that he was not alone and someone took him up there? It's unclear, and the circumstances of his disappearance remain a mystery today over a hundred years later. The location where Tommy's body was found is marked by an obelisk out of respect for this incredibly sad passing. Here's another disappearance, except this time, no trace has ever been found of the victim. On the 2nd of March 2010, 18-year-old Russell Bohling left his parents' home in Bempton at roughly 8am on the day of the disappearance. His car was missing from its parking space outside the house, indicating that he had left in it that day. At the time, Russell was taking a course in Brickling at the well-known Bishop Burton College and it has never been confirmed if he was supposed to have attended any classes on the day he went missing. Russell failed to return home that day and his parents reported him as missing. The following morning on the 3rd, his Renault Clio was found 45 miles away at Bempton Cliffs near a former Royal Air Force bunker on the East Yorkshire coast. This is a very rural and remote area, and the car was actually found the previous day at 5pm by a Royal Society for the Protection of Birds employee, but of course did not suspect anything out of the ordinary. A parking ticket was displayed on the window of the car, revealing that the ticket had been purchased at 11.30am on the day of the disappearance and had paid for the entire day. The car was still there on the 3rd, and the same worker grew suspicious that something was wrong. Russell's parents became suspicious as to how Russell had managed to drive from their home to Bempton Cliffs without using his debit card to fill up the tank as they believed there was under 4 litres of petrol remaining in the tank, and the drive would have taken around 45 minutes. His parents were confident that Russell did not have enough cash on his person or enough petrol in the tank to complete the drive without stopping to fill up. However, Russell's bank confirmed that no transactions had taken place on his account the day that he went missing. The police wanted to determine Russell's movements leading up to the day of his disappearance and found that he had visited York, Bradford and Bridlington, but left no indication of why or what he had done there. York is roughly 47 miles from Russell's home, Bradford is around 64 miles and Bridlington is approximately 20 miles away. 
Russell visited all three of these locations and didn't tell anyone that he was doing so. The police initially believed that Russell had travelled to take his own life as the cliffs are known as a suicide hotspot, but a body never washed up onto the shore. They thought this as they found what is described in many articles as a suicide tape in Russell's bedroom. This recording was found on a dictaphone and in which Russell spoke about not being intelligent enough and wanting to be buried in the countryside. This was quickly disputed by Russell's mother who stated that the recording was made three years prior when Russell was 15 years old and had been stressed about his GCSE results. Russell's parents believed that he had visited Bempson Cliffs that day to visit the nearby disused RAF radar station. Russell was thought to have had a particular interest in the bunker which was popular with urban explorers and was thought to have carried around a USB stick with pictures of explicit and devilish graffiti from that bunker. The bunker itself had been the subject of sinister rumours from the 1970s and onwards. Locals believe that the bunker was used by a satanic cult who would perform sacrifices, though I can find no evidence that was actually occurring. The Humberside Fire and Rescue Service searched the bunker using heat-sensitive cameras along with torches but failed to locate any sign of Russell. Sea, mountain and air searches were also undertook and similarly found no clues as to Russell's whereabouts. Two years later, in December 2012, firefighters returned and as a training exercise conducted a more thorough search of the bunker and were in there for around three hours. This second search cost Russell's parents £1,200 for the bunker's concrete sealed entrance to be reopened. Strangely, two years after Russell's disappearance, his family found his best pair of training shoes at the holiday home which they were convinced he was wearing on the day he disappeared. It's unclear exactly what happened to Russell and the family have come up with a couple of theories. Firstly, the Bowlings believe that a third party was involved in the disappearance as they suggest that someone else must have refueled the car. Russell's father was set to give him £300,000 so that he could start up a business, though I am not sure what an outsider would stand to gain by murdering Russell as he hadn't received the money yet. The police on the other hand believe that Russell had committed suicide that day, though Russell has never been found and his disappearance remains a mystery. Now, let's examine another. On the 20th of November 2015, Rory Johnson Hatfield was last seen by one of his friends at 12.15am when he left the York Central Travel Lodge on Piccadilly where he was staying that night. From there, Rory travelled to a nearby pub with another guest from the hotel after having met him and his father at the Post and Gate Weatherspoon pub at roughly 11.30pm the previous night. It has been established that Rory left the pub at around 12.30am but failed to return to the hotel and failed to turn up for work on the Friday evening. Police initially believed that Rory must have gotten into some difficulty while walking near the River Ouse around the Skeldergate Bridge area, as he was seen on CCTV footage in the area after 12.30am. The police and search and rescue teams carried out extensive searches around York along with underwater searches but found no trace of Rory. A further search of the river was undertaken by Rory's family alongside the help of the York Rescue Boat Service and the International Rescue Service. The police were not involved with this secondary search but was in communication with the family and said that they would provide assistance if necessary. Strangely, at the time of the disappearance, Rory was picked up on CCTV running and it was stated that people who saw him said that he looked like he was being chased, but the CCTV cameras nor anyone else ever saw anyone chasing Rory. Shortly afterwards, Rory was last seen on the balcony of a care home which he must have climbed up to get there. Was Rory trying to get away from someone? Did Rory see something that terrified him? Did he believe that there was a source of danger nearby or after him, it's unclear. In early February 2016, another search was initiated by his family who searched the riverbanks themselves, but recent flooding hampered their search. A drone was also in the air which flew 56 miles of the river on both banks and a Bolton search and rescue team used sniffer dogs along the whole length of the river which didn't produce any results. 
Sometime in 2017, after complaints made by the family, a Hull underwater search and rescue team used sonar scanning equipment but unfortunately did not provide any answers either. Rory's father does not believe that Rory had entered the river on November the 16th, 2017 he said. We've always maintained that Rory hasn't gone in the river, the police finished all of their searches just recently, that's two years down the road and there's been nothing found whatsoever. We need to move on from the river. Over three years have passed and to this day Rory has never been found. This case reminded me of the disappearance of Jason Norfolk which I have reported on in my previous video on missing people in the UK. I'm going to place that case here and there will be a card now on the top right with a link to the full video. I can only apologise if the narration sounds different. On December the 6th, 2015, 20 year old Jason Norfolk had been on a pub crawl in Old Town, located in Hull, UK. Jason was with his girlfriend and some friends at the time and in the early hours of the morning, Jason had left the bar known as Rumours by himself and was never seen again. I believe that this disappearance was highly unusual and we're going to get into why that is the case. Firstly, according to his girlfriend, Jason leaving by himself was unusual as he and his friends would typically let everyone know that they were leaving before doing so. She also went on to say, and I quote, Jason would not have walked out on his loved ones. However, no one at all noticed that he had left and as far as I can tell, Jason was happy and cared for. His girlfriend said about him, you could not find a better person than Jason. It feels like everyone is out looking for him. It is truly appreciated just how much the people of Hull and the surrounding areas can come together during such times. According to the authorities, these were the last people to see Jason before his disappearance. After leaving the bar, Jason made his way towards the city centre where four men briefly spoke to Jason and helped him out of a taxi someone else had ordered. It is thought that Jason may have had a minor altercation with these men before continuing on towards the town centre to find a taxi to get him home. Jason was last seen on CCTV walking towards High Street in the city centre at 1.26am, his precise movements thereafter are unknown. Jason never made it home that night and at 3.37pm later on the same day, around 14 to 15 hours later, Jason was reported missing after failing to return home. This is where things take a very strange turn. During Jason's walk, he passed what is known as North Bridge, which allows travel over a small river to allow him to continue on his journey. A large search effort was undertaken by the authorities and many volunteers and Jason's shoes were found in the mud next to the river. A few metres away his phone was found and slightly further his trousers were found with his wallet in the back pocket. It's important to note that his body was never found. Those facts alone are truly bizarre and very difficult to explain. I believe that the official explanation is that no foul play was expected and Jason must have fallen into the river and drowned. Jason's family in particular must believe that this is the case as they have petitioned that the local council should erect a fence around the area that Jason is believed to have fallen in. Despite that belief, Jason's mother also seems to have had some doubt. She said, and I quote, Jason was a fit lad. He might have been able to climb out of the water, you have to wonder why his body hasn't been found. You have to wonder if the fact that he was only slim and small is the reason that he hasn't been found. All kinds of things run through your mind, I still live in the hope that one day I will get him back, that he will be found. I will never be able to accept the loss, but at least I'd have some closure, Jason deserves that. Some questions remain here. Firstly, in my opinion, a robbery or mugging can most likely be ruled out as his phone and wallet were discovered untouched and nothing was stolen. Secondly, if we are suspecting that Jason had fallen into the river, can you come up with an explanation as to why he would have taken his shoes and pants off first? Or, are we suggesting that his shoes and pants came off during the alleged fall or a struggle in the water thereafter? I find that to be very unlikely. Thirdly, if someone had abducted or attempted to abduct Jason, why would they have removed his shoes and pants and not taking his belongings? And lastly, if we're suspecting that a drowning had taken place, and perhaps I don't fully understand this, 
But if Jason's pants and shoes were not washed away, why was the body which will have weighed many times that of the pants and shoes combined? Despite a large search, the body was never found, pieces of clothing were found including the shoes, and Jason disappeared next to a body of water without a single trace as to where he went. Just absolutely baffling, what do you think happened here? I'd just like to take a moment to thank all of you that have subscribed to the channel and who share these videos, like them, and just generally show support. I appreciate it a lot and can't thank you enough. Also, I'd like to say thank you to my patrons for supporting me over at Patreon, so thank you very much for all of your support and generosity. It is very appreciated and has allowed me to use the footage that you see on the channel, so thank you to all who have signed up. Anyway, do let me know what you thought of this one and you'll find all of the sources and links in the description below. As always, thank you very much for watching, I hope that you enjoyed this video and if you did, remember to like and subscribe if you haven't already, it helps me a lot. I hope that you have a great day or evening depending on where you are. Be safe guys and I'll catch you soon. Peace.